And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me is a returning good brother to the temple, previously known for the, for the many books and comics within the Viking verse as well as the eclectically named Old Norse for Modern Times. And now and now making his foray into the wonderful world of role-playing game development with, with When the Wolf Comes, the one and only Ian Stewart Sharp. How are you doing today? Thank you very much for having me. It's uh, always interesting for a Viking to be invited in by a monk. It doesn't <laughs> happen historically. Yeah. Well, well, willingly, anyway. Well, it's not. Well, you're not the only. You're not the only Viking in the te in the temple, anyways. <laughs> good, good. Well, I'm glad you're embracing them. Mm -hmm. Oh. But. I re I do remember you hinting at the you hinting at this project to me about about a year ago, and. I suppose I suppose, I suppose the first question to ask it is um, the origin story for you with role-playing games, because that's a question I didn't ask the last time you were on since, it, since well, I wasn't covering an RPG, so I didn't think it was relevant. Um, so how did you first get into role-playing games and what made it stick? That is a very interesting question. It goes back deep into the dark depths of time. Um, so I grew up in the UK uh, in a place called East Anglia, which is the little bump on the right hand side um, and it's pretty much a, a flat um, rural area with uh, lots of villages, lots of hay bales, lots of winding country lanes and as a kid me and my pals uh, used to you know, jump on our bikes and uh, ride between our houses and play role playing games. We played a lot of d and I think that was second edition that we were playing and I certainly uh, well, first of all, I had the box sets. You remember the, 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 the kind of red box set, and then, then the Master's Edition was a black, if I remember correctly. But then I had all the books, yep. the Dungeon Master's Guide, the Player's Handbook. Now, what really got um, us all interested, more so in role-playing, though, was the Warhammer Fantasy stuff. The Warhammer Fantasy role-play um, was a really great system, and we, uh, we played a lot with that. We played a lot of miniature-based games like Fantasy Battle. I had Warhammer 40k, all of that stuff. Um, and then, so as a kid, we played all of these things. There wasn't much to do in the countryside. Uh, if you've watched Stranger Things, as they, you know, those kids bike between each other's houses and play D&D, &D, well, it was all very similar. Um, so also back in the 80s. So, you know, Call of Cthulhu, uh, Judge Dredd, all of those kind of games were things that we picked up. And then uh, life got in the way. And mm -hmm. we went to university, we all split up, we all uh, you know, got girlfriends, wives, children, etc. And so I can't say that I played a, a, a game, a role-playing game for many, many years. And it was only just before COVID struck, I was paying a visit to a friend of mine uh, who's at Wizards of the Coast. We were over in Seattle and he gave me and the kids um, a D&D starter set. Uh, and on the ferry back from Seattle, they were just immersed. They couldn't tear their eyes off the pages. And so we started up again. And so for the past three years, all through the pandemic especially, we've uh, I've got back into being a, a DM um, and you know, really finding the the, you know, the the excitement, the passion, the love, and, and unlocking that in a whole new generation as well. And from that, we always had the idea that we'd do some kind of game in the Viking verse. Um, but once I tapped back into my love of RPGs, uh, it became clear that that was what I should focus on. And so in the last little while since we have spoken, I've been spending an awful lot of time uh, just uh, 
sitting and typing of an evening and, and adapting Robert Schraub's uh, uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord rule set. I can, I can get that. And for what is... When you mentioned when you mentioned that your hometown was was very flat, a part of me wanted to ask: Is it, are we talking? How flat are we talking? Like Denmark flat? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Denmark flat, Denmark flat. The uh, the the east of England was is pretty much reclaimed land. It's all fens and uh, and bogs. Um, when the Danes actually conquered it, as they as they did, it was uh, they they in the days of uh, the Viking invasions, it was actually the kingdom of Guthrum. Um, he took it all over and, and all the way down to London was part of the Dane law. And it must have reminded the Danes that uh, yeah, it was just like home. It was, uh, it was fens, it was fields, it was rivers, and it would have felt just like Denmark, home from home. Mm -hmm. Now, for what, for what it's worth, the whole, that whole thing of of um of bi of biking of biking from house to house and the like um i wasn't born i was born in the late 80s i didn't grow up in the 80s but i don't need stranger things to con to conjure that up because that's basically what i was doing both before and during the time when i was do when i when i turned the i turned my biking into a full into a essentially doordash before doordash was a thing <laughs> Joe. Oh. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna claim that I invented the concept. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure there are already there are already people doing it. But I was basically doing a one man operation of it on just my um, bike. And with now with that in, with that in mind. I suppose the the next logical question that I, that I should ask is, of all systems, why Shadow of the Demon Lord? So, um, I don't know if you've ever played Shadow yourself, but uh... I have, and I've re and I've reviewed it on this channel. Okay, great, great. So, one of the fascinating things about uh, the game is how kind of both stripped back, but also detailed it is. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of contradiction in terms. One of the things I really liked about it uh, when I first picked it up was the same, the similar kind of mindset. The uh, If you read the prologue uh, that Rob wrote, he talks about Warhammer fantasy roleplay himself. He talks about how he got bored with D&D &D, um, and how he wanted something grittier how he wanted something uh, that was more, um, that, was, that was just darker, that was full of menace, that kind of feeling. And so it really struck me that he had a similar sensibility to me in terms of what he was designing. And then one of the things that, I, that, that kind of annoys me about d, &D is um, you know, the, the proliferation of character classes and... Uh, you know, the, everyone wants to multicast and min max, and the, it's it, it seems somewhat detached from actual role playing. What I love about, uh, or what one of the things that I most love about um, Shadow is the paths uh, and the progression. You know, you really feel that your character is on a journey, uh, and the multicasting or the growth of your character feels organic uh, and that's one of the that's one of the things as i was looking at the character classes and the origins and the ancestries you know that really popped for me and it it was easy to take that uh, essential uh, foundation and make it work for the viking verse um and then just going on from there, you know, the simplicity of storytelling, the not having to have, you know, deception checks and athletics checks and uh, all of that kind of stuff every five minutes, um, but to just rule based upon common sense and your profession. 
so those are the those are the kind of things that I liked. Ultimately, the the Viking verse and stories in the comics um, that we're telling, the the sagas for a new era, are are just that. They're, they're stories, and and Rob's system allows you to tell a story, an interactive story, a role playing story, with the least fuss and most fun possible. And um, for me person, for me personally, there's a couple, there's a couple, there's a couple of things with um, Shadow of the Demon Lord that always stood out to me. Although I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that there seems to be quite the pattern of people developing their own games because they're dissatisfied with D and D. Yeah, I, 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 I think that that's true. D and D. It's one of the things about the Viking verse, as you know, is you know it's all about. Um, you know, divergent genetic code and uh, the rise of new peoples and, and races within the context of you know this new Norse mythology, this new uh, Norse history. And I think it's just true of everything. People, people, games, um, projects, they may well share a common ancestor, but um, there's a there's a sort of uh, a natural tendency to growth that uh, Darwin would be proud to see. Well, just to just to list off a few examples of this particular phenomenon with D and D in particular, um, a few that a few that come to mind: um, chivalry and sorcery, which was designed be which was designed because. The creator of it wanted the med wanted the medieval life aspect to be further emphasized. Um, Rollmaster started out as a series of house rules and then just evolved into its own thing, um, and then got somewhat simplified with Mer with um, Merp, but that's a whole other story. Um, I've talked about fantasy crafts in the past, which was basically took 3rd edition D&D, blew the whole thing up, and rebuilt it from the ground up. Um, and there's the upcoming Mythos, which I've done a video about, and looks to do, looks to have a bit, have a slightly more freeform approach to character creation and advancement within D, within D&D's framework. Yeah, you know, I see D and D pretty much as a you know, old ramp for the hobby, right? It's got the brand recognition, it's got uh, a fairly simple set of rules, and it's it's something that has seized the imagination recently. More and more people are coming to the hobby, but um, I I don't think it would do the uh, the Viking verse justice. There are plenty. Of Kickstarters recently that have used fifth edition walls as uh, the, and, and have been successful. There's a Beowulf uh, game that has recently been successful. The Spilland. Um, I've, had, I've had the guys behind. Um, I've had Dream Realm storytellers on, on the show a few times. Those guys do great work. Yeah, they do, and it's you know it's um, you know I've backed that one. I've got uh, all of those books sitting here, but I don't think that. Um, yeah, the D and D classes are entirely well suited to the Norse uh, era, and yeah, and and that's ironic because when you look at all of the all of the things that D and D is, uh, all of Western fantasy really does start with the Norse and the old English mythos, and even down to the language that we use. So, for example, a, a wizard. A wizard comes from the old English wise hard. I mean, it's just like die hard, but but it's wise hard. It just means someone who was the most wise. Uh, fighter and thief, they're both uh, old English and by extension, the old Norse words. Um, the, the, the concept of magic that we have uh, go back to the Norse tradition, and obviously, by the time it gets to D and D, um, 
you know, we've got much more of a kind of high Vancean magic system, but, you know, strip it right back to the, the core of Seva and Gand and Galda and those kind of um, magics. Uh, you know, they, they, we call them magic now, but really what it was, was, was knowledge. It was uh, people who had an understanding of how the world really worked. And as you know from our previous discussions, the Viking verse is all about what happens to the world when you strip the Christian influence from it and you remain in a kind of firmly pagan present. And that's a, a present where knowledge and what we might call magic are very much tied to the consciousness of the world, mm -hmm. uh, the consciousness of everything around us. And, um, and that thought that you know that that idea that everything was alive um has inspired everyone from tokyo onwards hmm. very that is definitely the case that is definitely the case <clears throat> um and i'd say truth truth be told truth be told if truth be told um I've always been I've always been against the idea of using of using D and D or pretty much any system, uh, as a as a be all end all when it comes to when it comes to fantasy. Uh, and I've I've joked because I've I've had some people tell me that you could do any kind of fantasy with D and D, and I'm like, okay, if, if that's the case, how how are you going to explain how are you then how are you going to do a say an in, say an Indian themed campaign when the when uh, a culture that doesn't have the same emphasis on swords as a lo as a lot of Eastern and Western European um, cultures do? Yeah, you know D and D isn't a one size uh, fits all. I think it's it's good what it does um and really what it does is what it says in the tin it's good at doing uh dragons it's good at doing dungeons it's good at it's good doing... at doing the tolkien melting pot exactly um but what i'm trying to do in when the wolf comes is strip that uh kind of fantasy archetype back to its pre-tolkien roots and to really try and explore what these uh, the archetypes were before they got Christianized and before they became uh, part of folklore. So, you know, my elves, going back to the Norse Alpha, are not pointy-eared tree dwellers who are good with a bow. They're something much more primordial and spiritual mm -hmm. uh, than that, you know, just as they were in, in Norse mythology. And in Norse mythology, Alpha were always mixed up or commonly mixed up with the uh, Dvergar or the, or the dwarves as they became mm -hmm. um, under, again, Tolkien's guiding light. Uh, you know, ultimately, these things were uh, spirits of the dead or, or spirits of elemental spirits. So trying to find a dividing line between them, you know, I've, uh, for the purposes of clarity and for role play, I've done that. But again, really trying to get back to uh, something that is genuinely Norse, something that is uncorrupted. That might be a bit harsh, but you know, the word is, is worthwhile in the sense that um, I do think that what D&D &D is, is a kind of sanitized, uh, simple version of all of these root myths. And I really wanted to get back to, uh, to those origins and enable people to play in something that was uh, a little darker, um, a little bit uh, more truthful. Mm -hmm. I can, I can certainly get I can certainly get that. And I think one of the obvious questions that I that I feel I feel I need to get get into is 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 when the wolf even though it's using the same si the same system. Is when the wolf comes standalone, or would someone 
be required to have the core book f for Shadow of the Demon Lord? No, it's entirely standalone. So um, the when the Wolf Comes book that will be going up on Kickstarter very soon is 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 a complete gaming system. It's got all of Shadow's rules uh, where they make sense. It's got them you know ad adapted and tweaked where they don't make sense, and it's got them evolved and improved where uh, necessary. So um, it will be a familiar book to people who played Shadow. Um, but it includes uh, you know, whole new systems of, you know, uh, call it magic for the sake of a shorthand, but it's really uh, spellcraft mm -hmm. um, and whole new uh, reskinned classes and origins. And then there are just simple things like, um, you know, we the, the stats are... Um, I've tried to make everything as authentically Norse or Old English as possible. So dexterity, for example, yeah. um, agility, those kind of words. They're very French. They don't exist. You know, they Obviously, they do exist in our, in our common tongue. But I've gone for words like might and slight and wits and will um, because those are good, strong Germanic root words. And, uh, you know, I don't mean to be, um, you know, I'm not trying to talk about, uh, you know, bloodlines or, or anything here that could be construed as right wing. I'm just talking linguistically. I've tried to select words that are at root a, uh, a much more Norse version. I spent all of that time doing the Old Norse uh, praise book, Old Norse for Modern Times, mm -hmm. and I learned a lot in doing that. And so stripping out the kind of French and Latin influence and having words for uh, stats and abilities that are as, uh, again, authentic as I can make it is is the approach that we've taken. And every, so I should also point out, it's been a bit of a labor of love because every character class has an English name um, and it also has an Old Norse name. Now, most of the time, they're very similar, um, but sometimes, you know, people might want to fully immerse themselves in the Old Norse. Other times, people will find that it doesn't trip off the tongue quite as easily as they hoped, and so they'll use the kind of anglicized version. And that goes for all of the spells, that goes for all of the, the creatures in the bestiary. Everything has an easy-to-pronounce English version that's, you know, that's, that's common, and then there is the... Uh, slightly more erudite uh, old norse version for people who want to you know really practice being a viking mm -hmm. and with that with that in mind i'm guessing i'm guessing that within the book you'll have so, you'll have some manner of pronunciation guide um because at the at the very least i don't want to make the same mistake i made with that with that slavic dnd campaign setting that I talked that I talked about a few months back. Yeah, sure. And so um actually um yeah there is there will be a brief guide, but the best way to really get your tongue around these things is on the Viking Verse website at the top in the menu bar is the Old Norse guide. There's a whole bunch of audio files for free. Um they are the uh, recordings that we made of the the print book. So people could go online and learn how to say what was uh, in front of them in print. And all of those are available free on the website. And that will give you a good starting point. It's, it would be tricky to uh, give a pronunciation guide for every single bit of Old Norse that's sprinkled throughout the Viking verse. But uh, there's uh, a, a good few hundred phrases there that you can learn. And in learning those, um, you'll get your head around how to uh, yeah, best scream things in Old Norse. Mm -hmm. Now, given that this is a Viking verse RPG, <clears throat> people are going to be there's going to be two kinds of people who are going to be approaching this. You have the, you have those who might be who might be fans of of Nor of all things Norse, but are not familiar with the Viking verse, and you and you're certainly going to have people who 
have have read through the novels and or the comic. So, but whenever you're doing something that's meant to be standalone, um, having main main ah English monk maintaining a degree of self of self containedness, especially especially for people who this might be their first entry into your work, is important. So I'm get I'm guessing that. Knowledge of the other Viking of the other Viking verse materials is can can help can help in places, but it's not a requirement. Yeah, exactly. I mean, one of the things that exists in the book, for example, um, is a complete alternative timeline. So again, the, the Viking verse is. Uh, 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 the modern world uh, that has trod a different path, trod a pagan path from a point of divergence back in the Viking Age. Um, so all kinds of things have changed and those things have changed because uh, Odin was ultimately trying to avoid his fate at Ragnarok. Um, you know, that's the, that's the ripple, that's the wave that rolls through all of the books. So by the time you get to this you know, it's, it's basically set in the present or the near future um, or the equivalent thereof. Um, if you've got an understanding of what happens in the books, great. And if you don't, it doesn't matter. There's a timeline in the book. It shows you how the world has, ev has evolved. And the Viking verse isn't meant to be so alien as to confuse people. It's It's in the same way as the Old Norse is a cousin to English and uh, you know, it, things are recognisable, so too is the Viking verse to uh, the real world. Well, what I've tried to do is just hold a bit of a dark mirror up, sometimes for the point of satire, sometimes for the point of uh, you know, making a statement. Um, you know, we've, we live in a world where uh, you know, the, the global warning uh, is destroying all kinds of things um yet you know we're not too fussed it would appear we're quite happy to march on as usual and my my hypothesis is that a, a pagan society that um, was very much um indebted to the world's tree and, um, and venerated Yggdrasil would do a lot more to save the planet than we're currently doing so it's things like that um there's stuff in it that will uh, seem familiar there are oligarchs there are uh you know nations howling at each other in rage um there are wars as you know the the jotun war comic will describe there are haves and have nots that's going to be the same in any universe but uh the point of the viking verse it takes a slightly different path through history Partly because the Vikings didn't go around uh, burning scientists in the Renaissance, rather they embraced them. Um, you know, they had always had a, a, a keenness within their culture for uh, knowledge and innovation. One only needs to look at the uh, Viking longships to understand that and their advances in navigation and their accomplishments in exploration. And so, again, that's one of the, the pillars. They didn't go around myopically uh, burning people as witches. Rather, they embraced witches because they were in touch with other realms. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> from the preview that you put that you put up on the draft page, I can see that when it comes to expert, when it comes to expert and obviously mythic paths, it's doing its own thing. I'd like to ask a question on the novice paths. Sure. Is it still the same basic four, or do you have a different set of novice paths that you use for um, when the wolf howls? Uh, yeah, it's slightly different. So um, uh, my four are uh, the wise, the scalds, um, the oathsworn, and the outlanders. Now they pretty much equate to you know, Rob's uh, first four, um, there's less of a priestly tinge, though. The Scald is, uh, is as in history, a 
man of letters, a, a, a bandier of words, they're equivalent to, uh, I don't know, an investigative journalist or a... Um, Diplomancer? A diplomat or a politician, yeah, exactly, it's that kind of class. And there are priests, but um, this is a world where, you know, the man is god to man and man is man is wolf to man the, if the gods exist uh they're very selfish and they keep themselves well hidden um and so any priest that there are uh, and there is a, you know the godsman is a class the, the gothi mm -hmm. uh, or gidio if it's female um that they tend to be showmen the equivalent of televangelists the uh you know they can command with their charisma great congregations um but they don't necessarily have uh, a direct pipeline to uh, the ICA or uh, any individual man upstairs and one of the funny things as well is i like that i like just to play on um you know shadow of the demon lord obviously the demon is the is the big enemy the various uh, the the various minions of the demon lord um I like the fact that you know Odin was demonized by Christianity, uh, and you know elves and dwarves were shrunk by Christianity and placed at the bottom of the garden. Um, flipping it round in the Viking verse, it's almost as if Christianity is the bogeyman, um, and you know certainly one form that Ragnarok takes is uh, a, a Christian form. Um, and that's not to the, that's not to be derogatory about Christianity or or any organized religion. Uh, you know, instead of worshiping you know the Forgotten Realms pantheon, for example, uh, it's possible to uh, worship uh, the a modern form of uh, Aesir, Aesir, um and it's possible to also worship. The Vanya, for example, but uh, you know, I've had a mess around with uh, cults and convergence of religions, and um, the book is full of a whole bunch of fairly plausible modern religions that are based upon these icons of the past. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, something that I th I think I think some folks might find a bit surprising or it or interesting, depending on who you ask. Is the is the tech level within when the wolf howls, or not when the wolf howls? When the wolf comes, what the hell am I saying? <laughs> That's but, right. He definitely howls on his way. Yeah, but it. But more more the fact that I think when a lot of I think a lot of people would have certain certain assumptions with a with a Viking adjacent game and utilizing. Um, utilizing quasi futuristic tech, I think would be a, I think would be a surprise to to some. And I'd like to speak on that tech level since we are dealing with um, technology that's ev that's evolved as a reflection of this cultural shift. Yeah. So again, like I said, I think the Vikings are. Um unfairly cast often as 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 pillagers and and warriors they actually had a detailed oral culture they had um some advanced uh, abilities in shipbuilding for example and they were very uh, adept at adopting other technologies um you know the clearly things like weaponsmithing uh, were were advanced and within their wheelhouse. You only have to look at uh, Ulfbert steel or or you know, even minting coins to see that they were perfectly on a par with you know, even the more uh, the, the bigger civilizations like Charlemagne um, and the, his empire to the south. Um, and they learned from people like the uh, Abbasids in. Uh, the Middle East. So um, the point here is that because they can learn and adapt and embrace and they weren't retarded in any way by any notions 
that it would be sacrilegious that the Norse uh, civilization advanced much more quickly in certain areas. Now, the, there are other areas where uh, it was retarded. So, for example, my conceit is, or conjecture is, that a civilization that uh, is again focused on Yggdrasil and the world tree wouldn't go out of its way to chop down all of the trees um, and wouldn't go out of its way to develop the internal combustion engine that was that was uh, powered by oil, gas, petroleum. Um, wouldn't go out of its way to use coal because you know there would become a a sacrilegious element there. Um, and at the same time, one of the uh, centerpieces of the Viking verse is that um, Yggdrasil is sentient and you are able to uh, embrace the world's tree and commune with the world's tree. Uh, and it's it literally, as well as metaphorically, spans the the nine home worlds um, and i won't go into too much detail there because it will uh, it will give stuff away but to suffice it to say that um mankind learns to travel along these greenways just like we have highways or motorways these greenways exist and that means that you don't even need the internal combustion engine so whereas uh, our society double down on it, double down on oil, double down on the car. Um, at a similar time in the Viking verse history, while uh, you know, motor engines were, were experimented on, they didn't uh, ignite, so to speak. They didn't catch fire. Uh, they didn't become mass produced, partly because there were alternative modes of transfer, transport that involved uh, the trees and trees and wood, um, wood that forms the ships. Uh, very much uh, the lifeblood of this North society. So those are kind of some of the ways in which technology changes. Um, the the other ways are all kind of related to um, the biological sphere because the Norse always venerated uh, nature. They didn't see animals as beneath man they saw them as as uh, parts of our world so you know there's there's no question that uh, you know dogs bears eagles they were creatures to be exalted um and so as the norse uh, science evolves it's not done so on the basis of the primacy of man uh, with everything else secondary it's done much more holistically and that leads them to understanding understanding of biology that uh, outstrips ours and leads them to um, crack the genetic code and do what uh, Watson and Crick did with DNA um, several centuries, you know, several centuries, several decades earlier. Um, and so uh, the, the, the Jotunwald described in the comics is, is a direct result of people being able to tamper with the DNA and people being willing to uh, embrace their uh, more animalistic side because it's not, again, not seen as blasphemous, but seen as natural. Um, and so, you know, whereas Norse myth has got berserkers and Ulf Hednar and, uh, uh, and all kinds of um, you know, shape-changing warriors, it's, it's natural for this society to embrace that um, and to make it their own, especially because they have the science to do so. So those are some of the, you know, the, the reasons and structures that enable the Viking verse to exist. Um, there are um, spacefaring ships, but not in the sense of the Millennium Falcon or, or the Starship Enterprise. These are, again, very much tied to Norse traditions of, of uh, shipbuilding, their bio ships, and they're directly linked to the greenways and uh, Yggdrasil itself. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, 
I something I'm cu something I'm curious about is the is um the concept of um spe of, of spells and gifts. Um what is the what is the devi I think for a lot of people they're used to seeing magic in the in the traditional approach of whether arcane or divine it's still magic but what's the divide what would be the dividing line between the two for someone just getting into something like this yeah that's a great question so the the, the kind of uh, the traditions of knowledge um, the spell craft those are things that you learn um, the, the most commonly used uh, word for magic in the Old Norse sagas is is Volkingi, which is, just means great knowledge. Um, the wise were practitioners of knowledge. So there's no uh, you know, weird chaos force out there or winds of magic that people are harnessing. People are just learning to do stuff. Now, again, I talked about the consciousness. So of the world so a lot of this is talking to elemental spirits or uh, spirits of ancestors um, but as much of it is using uh, psychedelics or using um, technology uh, to make it appear uh, magic right i mean there's that old phrase um, about uh, technology and magic that Arthur C. Clarke came up with that any uh, sufficiently advanced technology just looks like magic. Well, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's, that's, that runs through the Viking verse. It's not necessarily magic. It's some way of altering your perception or altering your consciousness or the interface of your consciousness with with the world and so that's where the knowledge comes in and the various different forms are uh, seder which is uh, uh, the old norse tradition that tends to involve illusion spells uh, gand which is uh, what uh, in historical terms that the people would regard the Finns as practitioners of they would be sending malevolent projectiles across the world um, so Gand is something that's very much dealing with ballistics and atmospherics. Um, and Galdar uh, spell songs, um, very much dealing with, again, Yggdrasil and the consciousness of the tree uh, and natural phenomenon. So each of them has got a real basis in both Norse mythology, but also a kind of a way to make them practical and believable it's not just someone waving a magic wand and saying some magic words and something mm -hmm. happens that said one of the weaknesses i always find i don't know if you see this you know in D, &D what on earth is the point of learning a language right so you might be able to, <laughs> you, you might be able to speak to an orc or a gnome but basically everyone's strong. <clears throat> why bother having it on your character sheet it's just a nonsense um doesn't you know it's it's it, it's one of the least well-designed things in role-playing games, especially considering how important um, languages are. So I've tried to make language and the learning of a language something that's instrumental in each of these um, crafts. So, you know, for example, one of the languages is uh, double de Verg, um, which is a pun on double Dutch, right? It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, the, it's machine code, it's binary, uh, it's bloody hard to learn. It's what dwarves speak. It's um, the net. It's the for the for those coming outside, coming from the outside in. Um, you could just as easily tell someone. Think of the adeptus mechanicus, and you're halfway there. Job. Well, there you go. So, and and so, I want to have a language that is worthwhile and esoteric within the game. So, that if you learn it, then that's the way that you unlock the craft. And if you if you don't have the language and the you know the equivalent of the spell components um mm. you know then you just can't do very much so uh, language becomes communication but it also becomes uh, part of the fabric of changing reality and that's really what runes were because runes are part of this um you know runes uh, were secrets 
Uh, that's what the word really means. And when people were writing staves and glyphs and sigils and runes, they were uh, etching a secret onto something and, and they come with a certain power. Now, you know, it's no different from us uh, inscribing a chemical formula today to make a, uh, you know, a compound metal all the stronger. So it's, it's that kind of thing that I play into. So language is a part of it. Now, the other thing you asked was gifts. So in the Norse world, and certainly in the Norse sagas, there are quite a lot of heroes who appear magical. Um, or do magical things, whether they shape change, whether they can speak to birds, whether they uh, have the ability to go mind faring. Um, uh, you, know, there's, there, you didn't have to be a sorcerer um, or the equivalent to be able to pull off these feats. And, and at the same time, you know, we talk about you know, human nature and uh, the gifts of nature. Um, and um, what is our nature? Is it do are we are do we have a good nature? All of that kind of thing. Nature basically also means, as well as the world around us, it means the world inside us. It means our spirit. Um, and so the spirits of ancestors are uh, very much part of this. And if you become powerful and enough, uh, or as you grow. Uh, the spirits speak to you more often. And so the notion of the composite soul that goes throughout Norse mythology of the, the hamir, which is your shape, uh, your huga, your mind, your hamingya, uh, which is perhaps your, your luck, uh, and your filga, uh, which is your kind of follower. And that's, that's most commonly seen in um, the... Uh, as a, I'm blanking on the name now, the Philip Pullman books, right, His Dark Materials, where they all have the daemons. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the filigree is, is similar to that, an invisible fetch. Uh, but lots of Norse heroes have them or felt their premonitions at an early stage. So I wanted to have the system of gifts so that. Uh, not only sorcerers could do things that are quote unquote magical, but great heroes could pull off otherworldly feats mm -hmm. uh, by tapping into this uh, spiritual realm. Um, and so it just it, it acts as another set of skills. Um, I didn't want to give away too many because then you know when you get to higher levels, you're just uh, you know. Uh, a walking bag of skills and your character sheet is 17 pages long. So they're very discreet, but they're also very defining. You know, um, I'm trying to get people to focus in. Uh, you can be very strong with your, you can be sheep strong uh, and have a strong hammer, uh, or you can have a strong lineage and your, uh, your luck or your hamingya is, uh, is strong but you can't really do both. Um, and so that's that's one of the things that I've tried to add into the system, again, to try and give it that authenticity uh, and believability about the Norse. Mm -hmm. Now, with all th with that in mind, when it comes... When it comes to... Oh, when it comes to the... The set the world that th that this is taking place in. Uh, I'm guess I'm because of the fact that a lot of people are going to be coming to coming to this from that outside perspective. I'm guessing that there's that um much like in some of your previous work, there's going to be a bit of a digression into some into some of the cultural things to at least for players to at least be aware of and. Have you considered putting that, putting that in a truncated form as as like an appendix that GMs could um, reference within the book? Yeah, you know that's a good idea. Um, I think they're a handy crib sheet. It's almost like uh, forget everything you know about elves because uh, you know that's all down to Tolkien and later writers. Mm -hmm. And so I think yes, it would be good to have a simple crib sheet. 
the, the chapter seven is all about the universe and the worlds and how we got there. And like I said, there is a, a big timeline. Uh, everything is described in terms of the technology and vehicles and, um, and uh, flight across the gap. Um, mm -hmm. The gap being uh, the Gununga Gap, the, uh, the Norse name for the, the void between worlds or as we call it, outer space. So it's all there, but I think yeah, a handy um, starter's guide might be a way to introduce people. I think that the, the, the best way to approach it is just let's think about what you know a modern Viking society based upon pagan principles would be like, and embrace that, and then have fun with it. You know that I've got rules for my. Uh, world but uh, you know, it doesn't matter you know, people people can use that as an inspiration to mm -hmm. think about what might have been or what if because that's where this all started it's just a big exercise in what if what if we could have a do-over uh, and what if um, we could do better as another prevailing civilization and world view and it does take a little bit of um, uh, deconstruction you have to get out of your common western mindset um, but you know that's part of the fun of of fantasy and certainly where we sit here which is the boundary of fantasy and sci-fi mm -hmm. um, and and taking you know classic fancy races and bringing them up to a modern era you know it's it, the whole point is to have fun with it to have fun with your inner viking and to uh, ultimately see if you can save the world yeah and to be fair there is a there is a proud tradition of no, of Norse myth um leaning it leaning into that that um blur that gray box between science fiction and fantasy, and I'd say the ultimate the ultimate expression of that is when Jack Kirby got a hold of it. Yeah, I'd I'd be interested in your opinions about that. Um, I I really I really like I really really like um Jack Kir Jack Kirby's work as a whole, and particularly what he did with. Um, mytho what he does with mythology, whether it be the new gods that he did in DC, or the way that the uh, the way that the Asgardians are tr are treated as the as essen essentially taking Clark's law to an extreme um, in the in Marvel comics. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's <laughs> it's interesting though. Now, I mean, we're talking as. Uh, Love and Thunder is is probably hitting theatres across the world, um, and I think that you know Marvel has done some amazing things for Norse mythology, but it's also um, it's also done some te some terrible stuff. Yeah, some... it's yeah, it's 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 it's, it's kind of twisted it a different way. Um, I'd so say. I'd say in that regard, um, the thing that the thing that uh, oddly enough, the thing that's helped me um, get the get the best get the best understanding before before I came across your work of no of Norse mythos is oddly enough in music. Um, in in particular. The bo the boom of folk metal that that I've been seeing over the last decade. Oh. Yeah, I think there's something you know very traditional, very spiritual, mm -hmm. very melodic about uh, a lot of that music, and um, uh, I'd something say... primal about it. Yeah. and I think it's, I think it's I think it's great at uh, you know, tapping into that part of our brains that that. That really does you know, kind of contain trace memories of this stuff, right? We can, the music helps us uh, take that flight of fancy and to imagine 
what it was. And look, I mean, again, if you look at Thor Ragnarok, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's some great um, songs in that, uh, you know, and that, that yeah. really carry and lift the film. Uh, I, um, I would, whenever I bring, whenever I bring up, um, folk metal, the, there's a few, there's a few bands that always, that always come to mind for me. Um, one of them is Twitter, or, or sorry, Twitter, um, who come, who comes all the way from the Faroe Islands. Um, and there's also stuff like Inciferum and, um, Corpiclani. And while some of, well, some of some folk metal acts like to do a whole lot of drinking songs. Um, to be fi- to be fair, yeah, it's it's going to be one of those natural things to come to come to come out because of, because of how harsh the the environment is. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's a there's a reason why uh, you know we're just talking about uh, uh, the immigrant song that's mm. in for. Yeah, the the Vikings were were migrants. They went everywhere because where they started from was a bit unpleasant. Yeah. Um, if you look at the age of migration, you look at you know even uh, you know the all the fall of Rome, all of the Germanic tribes, the the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the, the Lombards, um, you know the the Geats, all of these Germanic tribes that fought against Rome um, were roaming from the north uh, in great numbers. Um, and, you know, they just continued to do that, whether it was Iceland or Markland um, or further afield. So, you know, this, they, they took their traditions, their laws, their music with them. And, um, and I think it is uh, just ingrained deeper in our way of thinking than we really imagine. Yeah. Um. Now, I'm not. Sh- I'm not sure if this was mentioned within the b- within the book, but have you ge- have you given consideration to the idea of d- of um, putting in some sort of some sort of one shot module within the book? Yes. So uh, as we talk, I've actually just taken time uh, away from uh, writing a campaign. Um, I'm, it will be the first stretch goal of, of the Kickstarter. I'm fairly confident that we'll hit it. And then that will go out with, uh, with the rule book to all Kickstarter backers. And then um, you know, we'll, as we perhaps hit other goals, We'll commission other luminaries uh, who've also worked on Shadow or in my uh, stable to contribute and to you know to release some adventures because I do think that they're important. I think that you know again that it's part of the the tapestry of this stuff is to have as many stories as possible. And I also like the idea of that. In the same way as the, the novels have led to an RPG, I quite like the idea of the activities of a group of people playing becoming then the novel. And so the whole thing is as cyclical as Ragnarok itself. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing that I'm curious if you pl- if you plan on integrating this, um, have you considered some form of a appendix n not in not in name but in intent i e i e further reading slash inspir- slash inspirations yeah you know that's another good idea um i recently did a, uh, a chat with comiccon.com and i gave some recommendations for books to read um that would help flesh things out and I think that that's the sort of thing that I ought to incorporate in the latter pages so yeah good idea I will take a note and you consider yourself uh, contributing architect to this book as it comes out <laughs> I do I do appreciate that now right now right now it's in pre right now it's in pre-launch uh, do you have a, do you have a hard date set in mind for 
went for when you're going to launch the Kickstarter, or is that in flux at the moment? No, I think we're gonna, we've got a hard launch date of Tuesday the 12th of July, so um, that's next week as we are recording this, um, and then it should be up and out there and ready to go. All right, and what do you, sh beside putting aside um, stretch goals, what are you shooting for as far as a um, total page count? Uh, it's already at least 250 pages um, and may well extend further because uh, you know, one of the great things about Shadow of the Demon Lord is it had all of these uh, expansions and, uh, and extra rules and I've been able to cherry pick from them where uh, I felt they were appropriate. And so, yeah, it's, it's difficult to say until we've got everything laid out and, we, and we're in the process of laying out the pages right now, but uh, it's a fairly uh, comprehensive book that contains uh, a wide range of material and uh, should give everyone enough to uh, start off and have fun facing Ragnarok. Mm -hmm. And I, cer I certainly look forward to seeing how that will develop. But with that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for once again braving the hell of time zones to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. You're more than welcome. It's always a pleasure to talk to someone who is uh, as well informed and insightful as yourself. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>